Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive, a beautiful view off the balcony here on our new virtual backdrop. Don Moeller is going to join us here from a Baltimore County executive, but before we do that, and I have two Baltimore County executives here, one I actually campaigned against 45 years ago because I didn't have to <laughs> have. All of it brought to you by our friends at State Fair where we got together with Ted Benetoulos right before the mess began about a year ago. I think we were having chicken and waffles, and Don Moeller was doing French press coffee. Now across the street, you can go to El Guapo, get yourself a margarita, get some tacos, burrito, delicious Latin fare, and you know, the Aparicio and me really appreciates that. And great margaritas over there as well. Our friends at Fabies are shipping crab cakes all over the world. I've got a big surprise up my sleeve about crab cakes and the future. I'm just going to leave it at that. I've been talking about crab cakes, including with Evan Brown. And Dami Holland's going to join us next week when she's feeling a little bit better. And we're going to talk about shipping crab cakes all over the world. What makes a proper Maryland crab cake. Don, I know what makes a proper Baltimore uh, positive episode here. And anytime we have a, a Teddy ball game on, we have a great, great hour of conversation. So I'm looking forward to this. Oh, man. Well, we have former county executive uh, Ted Venetul was on. It's always a great day. It's a really small club. I always say those of us who have been county executive, Ted is the dean. He's sort of the <laughs> You know, he's, he's the one that, that holds the court, that brings us together. Uh, he's class historian, all those things. So, Ted, welcome back to Baltimore Positive. Uh, happy to be back, Don Nestor. Uh, Ted, Ted Net, uh, Nestor has taken – he's now describing – his interviews with you as therapy with Uncle Ted. Uncle he Ted. said that you, Uncle <laughs> Uncle Ted. He said he needs a dose of Uncle Ted every now Ted, and then. Ted, you calm to me. Keep him on the straighter now. Ted. The last administration I needed you, man. I, the, the, the the previous guy, you, you calmed me throughout this period. <laughs> the former guy. guy. <laughs> the, uh, Ted, Ted before, good? go ahead, Ted. Well, I thought we've had uh, to come in and you're the thing, Don. We have, I think, six former executives in Baltimore County that are still alive, active, get along. We have uh, frequent meetings. I don't know that there's any county that, uh, that has that. Uh, it, really, it really is special, Ted. And, yeah, and, sure and Ted. again, you, you – and it's really – it's really gratifying that the current county executive, uh, Johnny O, uh, has continued, you know, that tradition. He gets us together. So it, re it really probably is fairly unique, Ted, across the country. And you would know better because you travel yeah, the country. I think it is. Though. Somebody said to me, um, Ted, ever since you were county executive, no executive has been indicted. Now, that is a very low bar. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people, Ted, I tell people, Jim Smith and I joke all of the time with folks. We've been on a couple of Zooms uh, with some groups recently. And, of course, in addition to her podcast, Bagman, um, now there's a book yeah. by Rachel Maddell, Bagman. We know all the players. It's the Spiro Agnew saga. And Jim said, we need a few more executives to be elected so that our pictures can move down the hall. Because right now, <laughs> Jim and I and Kevin Kamenitz stare directly at Spiro Agnew. So in that hallway, we are reminded every day of that period in Baltimore County history from Spiro Agnew to, to Dale Anderson. It was, it really was not a great time. And Ted, you know what? You probably don't get that's a, you know, I'm glad you brought that up, Ted. This is why we love Baltimore Positive. You probably don't get enough credit as the guy who turned the page to a different way of doing business in Baltimore County. 1974, right, Ted? 1974, yeah. I was yeah, 1974. Ted, talk, talk, I mean, Ted, talk about that. Now you brought it up. Did you recognize that as a challenge and something that motivated you to say, damn it, this isn't who we are, and, and we, we can run government better. Take us back to that moment, Ted. Well, it was an interesting moment. Um, there was a lot of corruption. We had an old political machine, as you know, and they really governed not just the county. They had a lot of power throughout the state. Uh, that Baltimore County political machine uh, was, was really tough and had a lot of influence. We, um, a group of citizens, got together and said, look, we have to change that. Uh, Dale had gone to jail. Agnew would probably should have. 
So um, I had just run Don Schaefer's campaign for mayor, his first shot out. And um, I said I would help organize uh, a candidate. And we looked at Jim Fisher, who was at that time, was the president of Towson State College, not a university yet. He was terrific, young, articulate, funny. He was great. So we got Jim all the way up there. He's ready to go. We're organizing, mobilizing. And then he calls me, says, Ted, I can't run. I said, Jim, we're all set. You're going to win. He says, uh, they threatened my pension. So he dropped out. The old guard had enough control to be able to threaten his pension, and he didn't want to take that chance. So then they looked around in the room and who was going to run, and they pointed to me, and I became the candidate. And we waged that reform campaign. We had no money. We had maybe twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. I did not make a single phone call to raise money. It was all energy. We campaigned in the streets. We uh, went on the street courts, knocked on car doors, and Ask people to support us and put bumper stickers on the car. We grabbed that was, hey, Ted, Ted, that was unheard of. I mean, you're getting Nestor very interested now because <laughs> that kind of campaign was unheard of, right? No, it wasn't. But, Nestor, the way you have to do it, we would go up a volunteer. You have to have a lot of volunteers. We had the teachers and uh, uh, housewives weren't working then. There were a lot of women who stayed at home. There weren't two uh, people working in a family. Uh, you have to remember that was so we had a lot of volunteers who came out and we would do at least three things that are notable and necessary if you want to do them first we went to plant gates every morning spires point had about 35 40 thousand people they came in at different gates we would go to a different gate at five o'clock every morning and keep going around until you know the election was over those guys thought i worked there we got there so often <laughs> Yeah. The beginning of your day every day was where the most amount of people were, right? Literally. Oh, absolutely. You couldn't get it any better. General Motors, perhaps, their plant over on Browning Highway was big. Uh, but they, they only did they, one or two shifts. Anyhow, the, um, so after that, what do you do? After 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30, when you finish, you can't go home to bed. You're all revved up. We would stand on the street court like at Hollabird and uh, Dundalk Ave. And those it kind of major intersections where the cars would back up with lights on the lights. A volunteer would go up and say, say hi uh, to a guy with the window closed when they're installed at the lights, say hi to Ted Manitoulis, he's gonna be your executive. I'd go over after they pulled down the window and shake hands. Then a volunteer from behind would come up and say, can we put a bumper sticker on your car? And we had a volunteer at the bumper, at the bumper and if they said yes, they slapped on the bumper sticker. We would get maybe 15 bumper stickers every morning. Now imagine that in a community when they went home. Then when you finish that, what would you do? Well, at around 10 or 10.30, the ladies at the house would go out and shop. So we would go to the, the, the Mars, to Giant, to the uh, various shopping uh, places and help. The, I would help them with their bags, put their bags in the car. And a volunteer would be with me, hey, can we put a bumper sticker on your car? And they, of course, always said, yes, I helped them with their bag. So what was happening? And then at night, besides the three receptions, we would hit the bars on the east side. Don, you know what that's like. That's where they go after 10 or 11 o'clock. I've over been to Costas. I, I know what you're talking about. It's, it was terrific. We would hit the bars. We'd have three home receptions before that. And um, before long, they were all talking about that. Too. The mother would say, did you see the father? Did you see Ted? Over at the plant today, he said, oh, yeah, did you see him? Yeah, he helped me with my, bag, with my uh, bags. And it, the talk on the east side, we beat him on the east side, 8, 9, 10 to 1. And so when I see Trump carrying those areas, it's really appalling to me. They were, you know, Don, they were such great Democratic areas. Uh, at some point, we have to get them back. We have to make sure that the working person understands that, our party, our, the Democratic Party, I don't want to make a partisan uh, idea here, but the fact is that it is the party that is really sensitive to people who are working and, and, and don't, aren't treated appropriately. And um, we're getting back to that. Joe Biden is getting back to that. But anyhow, that's what it was. It was a street campaign. It was uh, I, I, rather remarkable. I, I couldn't duplicate it statewide. It was too much. Ted, Ted I, I want to go back to that time because something triggered me about corruption and about Dale Anderson and, and Spiro Agnew and taking over 
and a place where corruption was the way business was done. How aware were you when you're standing out on those street corners, you know, shaking palms with my dad down at the plant? Uh, because my dad was going to the rod mill every day in 1972, yeah. three, four, yeah. five, and six, right? But, but how aware were you that even 35 years later, Rachel Maddow's coming up with these stories of how greasy it was? We knew that something was going on. We didn't know the extent of it, but uh, there was a lot of newspaper articles and tough conversations. And we'd bump into people who say, you know, they asked me for money for my liquor license or whatever it was. So we knew that. And that's why we campaigned. The problem was not the campaign. We won that handily because people, instead of having to go up and, and knock on a window, people would honk after a while. And at the plant gate, they'd say, hey, run to us, you shook my hand yesterday. Why don't you come in and work? You know, I mean, it was that kind of a thing. You'd get that recognition and it happened. The problem was governing. They hadn't done anything. They were on the golf course or making deals or the zoning was absurd. And uh, that was the problem. We had to literally, uh, Don, when you talk about being the founder or starting, we had to get a whole growth management program for zoning, for growth, for regulation, very controversial. We had to start the floodplain program. People's homes were being flooded and they didn't realize why. Well, they flooded because upstream, they were cutting down the trees. And downstream, this, the rivers would overcome, and and they uh, and they would flood. Uh, so we well, had to we had to stop that. We Ted, had you had the audacity. You had the audacity in 1974 to suggest that the county needed to work closer with the city. Absolutely, you know, our relationship with Don was important, and we did. Now we did it quietly. Schaefer and I would do a lot of things quietly because they knew that it was tough in the county to do that. But I increased, increased the cultural budget from about, I don't know, the county was contributing to the Symphony of Lyric, Morris Mechanic at the time, music, maybe $50,000 a year spread with all of them. We raised it before my administration was over a million dollars a year. All you guys kept raising it, and it's a nice hefty fee. Yeah, we but got it up. at the. I think, I think Kevin's last budget... I want to say it was three point six million. Very, very There's proud of that. There's two ways to go about that, Ted. Right? There's two ways to go about that. You either build your own mechanic yeah. up in Timonium, or you build your own stadium like they did in Atlanta and try to steal right. it from the city, or you try right. to work together. Right? Yeah, exactly right. Now we did one thing, and the, and the city liked it. Schaefer liked it. We needed a summer home for uh, the symphony, and we built that out at Oregon Ridge. Uh, we didn't build a facility other than a facility to uh, house the symphony. But if you've been out there, it's beautiful during the summer. You're up on the slope, slope people bring their blankets, and the symphony performed. Um, well, that's so what we, Meriwether Post was for, too, right? Meriwether Post yeah, right. was also built for symphonies. Right. So, anyhow, we, uh, uh, Don, you're right. That was, that was very important to our administration. Important because I think everybody afterwards, you and Kevin and uh, Jim and Dutch, all recognized the important, Dennis and Don, the important. All of them. Well, every one of you, the cooperation that never really existed before. We've got to do more, by the way. The city today really needs the suburbs to help them out. And well, it's to, to our interest to help them out. Well, frankly. I think it's really encouraging. That's one of the things I, I think from, from what I gather that uh, Johnny and, 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 uh, and the mayor have a, a very close uh, relationship. And as you said, that, that's all good. Um, Ted, Ted, we're with Ted Vanatoulis, former Baltimore County executive. Um, a player, and we're going to have him talk about that. Matter of fact, let's let's do that now because not, no topic has excited us more, Ted, than all of the recent reporting around Montgomery County businessman Stuart Bainham buying the Sun, saving the Sun, as we've talked about for over a year. Uh, yes, there's so never well. an article written where your name is not connected in some way. So. Folks out there want to know, Ted, give us an update. Where are we? Well, um, Stuart Bainham is making an effort. It's not completed yet. He's engaged in uh, due diligence and additional discussions and negotiations. So the deal isn't through, but he has stepped up, not only to purchase the sun if it's available, but to do it through a nonprofit. And that may be the model that newspapers need to survive. As you know, the newspaper business has really difficulty and collapse and the old models 
simply aren't working. And we'll find out if the new model of a nonprofit, the money, whatever profit exists, and nonprofits have to be profitable, will be plunged back into the newspaper. That's the important thing. So um, uh, anyhow, Stu is at it. Uh, I've been helping him. Uh, we're making some progress. It isn't done yet. The, the people in this region are going to have to support it after, if it's purchased locally, as Stu is. He was on the board of Johns Hopkins on the symphony board. So besides being from Montgomery County and as a former state center, he really has a lot of local ties. But the important thing is that we have to, we have to support this like we would a football or a big league franchise. You remember when we lost the Colts? How can we forget, right? And we wanted to bring a team back. What did we do? We had to build a stadium. We had to get seat licenses. We have to buy, buy, we bought season tickets. We did everything we could. Well, this is the same thing we have to do for the newspaper. It is an institution as valuable as our sports fr franchises. So we really have to get behind it. Whether we agree with its editorial or not, the fact is a newspaper is a valuable asset. Not only does it help prevent corruption and bad management and all that, it's a cheerleader. I remember I have a photograph at home. I was coaching the Red Shield Boys Club piggy bank kids, the 10 to 12 year olds, and we won the season. And we then went to the piggy bank bowl. And it was the year for us to host it. So we were to, we played at the stadium, the old stadium. We played the piggy bank bowl from a group from Shimokin, Pennsylvania, the old coal and steel town. And we thought for sure we were going to get beat by those rough guys up in Shimokin. We beat them six to nothing. It was, a, it was really great. At the stadium, fans in it, the parents and the other fans. And the Sun paper covered it live. That would never have happened. That, was a, that wasn't Red China. That wasn't economy. It was a little ball game with a bunch of sweet kids out there playing their heart out. That was cheerleading. The, the papers recognize heroes. They recognize goodwill. Never mind all the tough stuff they do, which is important. They are, the paper is a major institution. And that's why Bob Embry and I, years ago, when they were sell, Tribune was selling it, tried to get it. It just didn't work out. They had bankruptcy, too many orders. But Stuart Bainham has stood up. I keep teasing him that uh, when this is over, I, I'm going to get Barry Levinson to write a, uh, uh, write a movie about it, and we're going to star George Clooney as Stuart. Tell me about Stuart a little bit, Ted. Uh, for, for folks that, that aren't familiar with the political background and the philanthropy, you know, I always ask, who's at the head of the organization? What would this look like, and what would Stuart's role in this be? Well, think of the foundations that we have, the Abel Foundation, Goldsecker, uh, Langborough. We have some great foundations. It would be essentially like that. It has to be profitable. That's the key thing. There are tax advantages to people who want to make donations. They'll be able to accept donations, big contributions. They'll hold major events that they can charge for, like debates. They have to make revenue. There'll be, think of public broadcasting. You have members, you have sponsors. There's a whole host of, of, of ways that you can uh, get revenue that's not available. And if the sun brings Rhea Fikin and ask for money, they're going to do all right. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> Ted, Ted, talk about... Go, go to Nestor's question, though, because I think it's a good one in that folks up here, you know, Montgomery County may be familiar with Stuart Bainham, but folks up here really aren't. Tell, tell it sounds like a Baltimore guy about, to me. Is, tell tell them about who he is. Met, you know? Tell, tell well, folks about who he is. He um, is just a very decent person. I mean, that's the good thing about him. He's, he's really very decent. His uh, family owned uh, nursing homes. Uh, they also then bought into the he, he managed the company, bought into hotels, choice hotels and others. Uh, they were very fortunate. They made, and, and, and Stewart will tell you that. They'll tell you he was uh, born on second base. Well, the fact is that when he stepped up to do this as a nonprofit, he had a home run out of Camden Yards to do this. But he's a very decent guy. He was a member of the House of Delegates, got to know Maryland politics, became a state senator. These are not easy things to do. It showed a certain uh, popularity and respect in, within his community. And uh, he grew the business uh, to, it's a, it's a really a billion dollar business. And they created a foundation. 
that is very substantial, has done a lot of philanthropic uh, deeds, and has created a special foundation to purchase the sun. I think it's called sunshine, sunshine for All or something of that nature. But he is uh, smart. He is savvy as a businessman, smart and diplomatic as a politician. He has all the ingredients and interested in communication, media, newspapers. He has all the ingredients that one needs to be able to pull this off. I think he's a, uh, an equivalent to, to Bob Embry in our own community, who has that kind of philanthropic uh, desire and, and instincts. And he will be a great owner if and it's not done yet. You know, we have to remember that. There's still a lot of... Uh, What's the timeline on this, Ted, for real? Is this something that could happen next well, week, next month, anywhere, or this year? It could be anywhere from two weeks to two months to get the due diligence done. But it's not far away. It's just these are tricky. To go. I've been through them, and you a lot of potholes and uh, uh, skirmishing and nego negotiations. So um, It's a lot of money, right? And it's a lot of money. He's paying a lot of money for it. I think the newspapers have said he's paying, you know, with $65 million. That's a huge amount of money for a newspaper in this era. But he's determined. Ted, are you convinced, are you, are you convinced that we have a willing seller? Uh, now, yes, not before, because we tried. Uh, they did not want to part with anything, unless it was such an exorbitant amount of money that you could not step up, because then you'd fail. And I know Bob and I did not want to fail and be the ones who closed the sun. Uh, we're local kids, you know, local people. Um, uh, uh, but Stewart has uh, driven a hard bargain. And um, uh, so I think at this point, they wouldn't be engaging in this if they weren't serious. They had to provide all of their documents, all of their financial stuff. And um, so I think that's part of a hedge fund deal. They take these papers, they kind of strip them down. Uh, solidify the news hole, uh, get rid of veteran uh, newspaper people so they cut their costs, hire more younger ones, newer ones, who don't uh, uh, cost as much, and, um, and then sell them off, maybe piece by piece or as a group. Um, so this is, uh, I think at this point, they're both serious. Whether it happens, it depends on the uh, completion, what's in the negotiation, what the pothole is. It could be things like pensions, you know, there are a lot of uh, issues, cash flow. What do you have to pay for the services that the Tribune providing to the Sun now that the owners would have to pick up because they're not available any longer? Um, uh, printing and what those cost and how do you, what do you do with printing? Uh, there are a lot of issues that have to be resolved, but I think it's going to happen and we'll just have to wait and keep our fingers crossed. Pat Venetoulis is here talking all things Save Our Son. Of course, uh, two Baltimore County executives, Don Moeller joining us here. We're usually having a crab cake at Faley's or hanging out over at State Fair with Ted. Uh, we're doing it all virtual here for at least a little while. Uh, sounds like Stuart Bainham's going to be a, a, an interesting person to have on at the end of this acquisition and, and moving forward for all of media, right? Like, so much has changed. Ted, I mean, I see you on the internet all the time, right? I mean, it, it is a different world than where newspapers were, and newspapers are going to have to rethink distribution in a lot of ways, right? They are. And that is a big issue. Uh, you have to really transition to a, a more substantial digital environment, almost like the New York Times and the Washington Post have done. Uh, and that is a transition because it does require different kinds of skills, different marketing. Um, but it's inevitable, though, that, that it'll be more substantial digital work than print work. So we'll see how that goes. And I think Stewart is aware of that. He has a very contemporary mind. And I think um, his management will produce that transition. That the problem with newspaper is we didn't make the transitions quick enough when it was ha happening. And uh, now um, I, think, uh, I think he's on to it and will develop a good team that will be able to make that transition. Well, Ted, we, we're hopeful we're going to count on you to keep us updated on that as we go through. Before we let you run, I uh, want to get, pick your brain just a little bit. You're, you're our resident political scientist among the many hats you wear. Can the United States Senate, Ted, function anymore without getting rid of the filibuster? I think it's going to be hard. Uh, you know, the filibuster has an interesting history. It was... The only people that really used it were the Southerners against any voting or uh, 
uh, racial issues that came that, that emerged. Southerners would just get up and talk, and then you'd have to wait them out and get the two thirds required. But we always did uh, because there was a better relationship between the two parties. So I don't think it's necessarily the filibuster. I think the fact that we have a, a party that is not behaving as a legitimate loyal opposition, it's been captured by people who are, are there's something wrong. They've lost their minds. And the Republican but, Party, which is a great party, has got to come to grips with that and become a party that's a loyal opposition, which means that there are times when you cooperate with the governing party. And that's been the greatness of our society. But the fact that they would not accept the transition of power was a very serious moment in the history of the Republican Party. That, not, that only a few of them voted to essentially say that Joe Biden won the election. Think about well, it. Ted, it's, it, I think it's even bigger than that. And I think you're painting a picture that's accurate. And I think it's even bigger. I mean, just recently, after hiding in a bunker, understandably so, for six weeks or so, Mike Pence, obviously trying to put his finger in the wind and figure out which team to play for, came out recently and wrote an op-ed where he decided to double down on the big lie that the election was stolen. So Mike Pence, who would have truly been hung on national television or murdered, either shot or hung, on national television in one of the most horrific historical events to ever take place in our country uh, would have been hung along with your good friend, Nancy Pelosi yeah. came out and now wants to double down on that lie. My, my question comes back to you is I don't think we're governable and I have friends who think I'm exaggerating and I truly don't think I'm exaggerating. I don't think we're governable as long as the filibuster remains if 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 the filibuster is what's going to determine whether we can move for example our good friend john sarbanes just proudly had passed hr1 the for the people Act. yeah hr1 one of, the, one of the most important pieces of legislation put forth in in the last decade and encourage all of our folks to go out and listen to john sarbanes uh congressman sarbanes on baltimore positive go good. look at what the legislation does it's pro Democratic legislation. It did not get one Republican vote in the House. And it will not get one Republican vote in the Senate. So I don't think we're governable with the filibuster, Ted. That's because you now need two thirds. But the, the reality is, Don, I want to come back. If the Republican Party had better principles and morals, if it hadn't been taken over by an extremist, I mean, really, people that that just they lost their minds. An insur inter insurrection carrying weapons into the Michigan State House. Think about Ted, that. Ted, that's Even like saying that's like it. saying Ted, that's like saying that if you and I and Nestor could have hit a slider, we'd be in the big leagues. We're <laughs> not in the big leagues. So when people say we need the Republican Party to grow a soul and revisit the traditional Republican Party of the Rockefellers and the Scrantons and, and and uh, the Romneys, even. That, well, what, the Thiuses, I mean, the Helen Bentley. Yeah, but that's Ted, the, Ted, Ted, on, Ted, you're a political historian. That's not going to happen, is it? Well, it could. We've got some decent, you know, in the council, some decent Republicans. They've got to stand up. They've got to stand up and say, this isn't our party. It's got to go on the grassroots, the local level. What's happening is just the opposite. There's plenty of Republican legislators on a local level are trying to stop voting. Can you imagine that? Prevent people from voting. The greatest thing this democracy can do is well, vote. Ted, that's, that's my point, and that's why I'm pushing <laughs> back. My point is, so in the meantime, well, I thought it was 33. This morning, I now see it's up to 43 states have 40, le legislation 40, 40, 40. on pending to restrict voting access. So while we wait. Can't imagine anything more un-American than that. No, no. So no. while we wait for Republicans to somehow. Worse. So while uh, we wait. Uh, 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 attacking the Capitol. Okay. So Trying while we wait. Transition. While we wait for Republicans to crash and burn, rediscover a soul, become a true 
opposition party with real ideas again while we wait for that is the only alternative then just to do nothing well, let the senate not because the senate ted unless i'm wrong i want you to help me if i'm wrong the senate can't function now i i agree with you the problem is it's a it's a catch-22 you can't you need uh I don't know, 60 votes to break the filibuster. We're not going to get 60 votes to break the filibuster. My theory is we got to whip the hell out of them in the next off-year election. Get a huge majority in the Senate and the House. Win it big. Well, the way that happens is good governance, right? Literally. I mean, this is a party not interested in governing. Joe Biden really does sort of want to govern. This party wants to govern. You're exactly right. They don't like government, which is ridiculous. So therefore, what I'm saying is, get Joe Manchin, get Kristen Cinema, to see the light, get the 50 votes, get Vice President Harris to cast the 51st vote, get rid of the filibuster, and govern. Because my theory is, is that when the Democrats move forward on things like HR1, the public will respond very favorably. They do not care how the sausage is made. Most <laughs> of the public couldn't spell filibuster, couldn't care about what it is, and probably thinks it's the name of some Southern cartoon character. They well, don't know right. what the filibuster is. They just want <laughs> government to work again. No, 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 I'm with you, and I understand your passion about it. We're going to get Manchin and people like that. We're going to get the 50 votes, 51 votes that we need for most of our stuff. You watch. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get him back into the fold. So we can keep our 50. You need 60 to break the filibuster. That we won't get unless we win the off-year election and pick up uh, eight or nine seats. But, but, Ted, we can, we can, but Ted, we can do away with the filibuster with 51. We don't need 60 don't to so. get rid of Yeah, I'm confident. If you can leave 51, there's no reason not to do it then. Correct. Uh, I thought you needed 60 votes to get rid of the filibuster. I may be wrong, and we ought to look at that. Because if you need 50 votes, they've got, we've got the votes to do it. If Manchin and Cinema will come well, along. To, think- to be continued, Nestor. Well I, well, I know you guys are always going to continue. Ted, I want you to rest up here for springtime. You got your shots yet? You got your vaccines? Well, we got our first one. In fact, right after the show, we're going to get our second one. All right. Well, uh, roll the sleeve up, as they said to me on the show the other day from Carol. Right? <laughs> Take care of yourself. It's always great Thank to talk you. some politics and some history with you. Uh, at some point, we're going to get together and have a crab cake. Hey, if one crab cake in life that you would eat, what, what crab cake would you eat, Ted, if I was going to take you for a well, crab cake? We had crab stew last night that my wife made. It was just outstanding. Uh, we go to, um, what's the place at, off North Point? Um, Costas? Uh, yeah, Costas, right. Okay. See, yeah, see, no. Spoken Greek right. style. Thank you very yeah. much. I mean, just, just great They're stuff. Ted's friends. They're Ted's buddies, Nestor. Yeah, they Ted, are. Ted's uh, known them forever. Ted's <laughs> known them forever. My dad, the, the, the elder people grew up with my dad. Was, they were all together. They're the first that generation that came over from the old country, you know. Now, the kids are running it over there, but uh, it's, it's, it's a great place. All right, well, Ted, here, here's the deal. Hey, Nestor, I, before, go ahead. Just, Go ahead, Nestor. How great this program is. It's terrific. Keep it up. Thank you. I was going to say this. My mother and I would go to Costas, and we would always go Mother's Day and have the beer, the crab cake, the (laughs) the whole deal, right? Greek potatoes, Nick Nick and Pete make me up. By the way, if you've never had the cream spinach at Costas, it's one of the best things in the city. And I know they're known for crabs and all that, but I always tell people, Get the cream spinach and get the uh, get the mushroom caps as well. Spani kopita, it's called. Spani, Spani kopita, kopita. Right. 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 But 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 the cream spinach not in the in the filo. No, I'm not talking about baked. I'm talking about just cream spinach. So I take my mom. So here's what you you're getting the shots. My wife's getting her shot. I'll get my shot. I will know the plague is over when I can pick you up at the front door, right around the corner, and we can drive yeah. over to Costas together yeah. right. and have a proper crab cake at the bar. I'll know the plague's done. Hey Nestor, I'm going to give I'm going to give our listeners a little treat, a culinary treat here, and I bet you've never heard of this, Nestor. Okay. Ted Venetel, Ted Venetel was introduced me to a cocktail at Costas that I had never 
her, I love a good Bloody Mary, like most people. Oh, okay. And I'm a, I, I like to fancy myself as an aficionado <laughs> of Bloody Marys. And Ted Venetoulis orders a Bloody Mary, and he says to the waiter, waitress, and if you just put a dash of orange juice in it. You got and it. I looked at Ted, and I said, what was that? Is that and he said, stuff? Don, what is that? He what said, you, you've never had that? a Bloody Mary. Am that I right, terrific, Ted, until buddy. you put some yeah. orange juice in it? <laughs> you got it, Don. Terrific. A little more vitamin C there. Ted, take care of yourself. Stay healthy. Stay strong. Get All that right, second guys. shot for you and your wife. We'll see you in Lynn sometime soon, okay? Take it easy. Thanks, Appreciate Ted. it. There he goes, Ted Vanatoulis. Two, two Baltimore County executives for the price of one. Don Moeller, uh, our uh, co-host here. And, by the way, if you've missed any of the hospital stuff, I want you to go out and check that stuff out from the Maryland Hospital Association. We had so many great guests on talking about the miracle workers, talking about mental health, talking about children during COVID, talking about staying safe and getting this vaccine uh, with, uh, with Gregory Branch as well as Johnny O. So we've been doing a lot on the vaccine space. We're getting ready for baseball season, March Madness, and everything here. We are BaltimorePositive.com.